my, the abstract of my talk. And uh, uh, okay, so uh, I, I don't need to spend time on that. So as context of this lecture, I will give first a few crucial definitions, uh, which I think will guide us uh, uh, in the discussion. And then uh, uh, we look at what are the present and the future challenges of, uh, of research in particle physics, uh, experimental particle physics, that is. Uh, and then we will look at uh, how we can really uh, try to inform uh, uh, machines of what are our real objectives, because uh, uh, if we don't do that, uh, we are going to face uh, a misalignment. Uh, you need to mute, please. Uh, yeah. A, a misalignment that hits us with uh, uh, a, a suboptimality of uh, the resulting solutions. Um, and then uh, the frontier is, uh, in my opinion, the end to end optimization of experimental design. Uh, and I will tell you a little bit more about what that is. So first of all, what is intelligence? I think we need to ask ourselves this question uh, before we discuss what artificial intelligence is. Uh, and uh, okay, you know that the term intelligence comes from Latin intelligo, which means to comprehend or to perceive. But that uh, in fact doesn't help us, uh, us very much. Uh, and uh, it is uh, interesting to note that uh, definitions uh, that uh, that uh, that the suit us are not so easy to find. So you could say that uh, you can see here a few attempts. Um, for us, uh, what uh, is more abstract uh, could be more useful, and uh, such as intelligence uh, as a measure of an agent's ability to achieve goals in a wide range of environments. Okay, so if we train machines to be able to do that we may claim that they have intelligence or intelligence is goal directed adaptive behavior as a synthetic uh, expression. And so then one, what is this artificial intelligence? So also that is challenging to get. Um, and uh, and uh, yeah, so we can speak of uh, intelligence demonstrated by machines to, to say that. Uh, but that is also suboptimal because it puts automatic wipers and thermostats in the artificial intelligence category. So we want to be a little bit more specific. Uh, if there's an effect also at play in place so that uh, we uh, continue to be uh, become familiar with new uh, applications of uh, uh, advanced uh, computer science, and, uh, and uh, so we tend to believe that artificial intelligence is not with us. And uh, so artificial intelligence is what hasn't been done yet. Uh, this is uh, the, the AI effect. So we continue to raise the bar as we get accustomed to progress. So self-driving cars are just a smart uh, neural network with lots of input data. And uh, speech recognition is uh, Okay, it's an algorithm, uh, it, uh, it's complex, but not real it's artificial intelligence. And uh, so, so you, you can do this kind of exercise for almost everything that exists in the market. And uh, at the basis of this is a little bit of a reluctance for us to, to talk about artificial intelligence and, to, and, and, and we as sentient beings, and we know what we are doing and not the machines, but we are machines as well. And so uh, we have to go back a little bit. And uh, uh, so one, one thing that we can, uh, that we can start is to, to uh, no, no, it's okay. It's okay, no, there's nobody in the room. Um, so what is learning really? So this is the relevant question I think that we need to ask. And uh, it's also not idle to answer this. Some definitions of learning are the process of acquiring new or modifying existing knowledge, behavior, skills, values, or preferences, or the acquisition of knowledge or skills through study experience or, or being taught, or becoming aware of something by information or from observation. 
So learning involves uh, us uh, adapting our response to stimuli via continuous inference. And uh, how do we do that? The inference is done by comparing new data to an already processed uh, uh, set of data. And this is done by the use of the mechanism that is called analogy. I think much of this is really uh, that, analogy. Uh, analogies are the heart of thinking. There's this wonderful book by Ofstadter and Sander that examine this in really detail and, uh, and uh, argue that they are the building blocks of our learning process. So this must happen also to machines. We learn new features in an unknown object by analogy to known features in similar known objects. And this is true for language, for, for tools, uh, for complex systems everything that we interact with, uh, that we have uh, experience of. But uh, even before we start to use analogies, we need to take objects and uh, uh, acknowledge them and classify them in their equivalence class. So in a sense, so only once you have done that, you can start building analogies. So in a sense, classification is even more fundamental in our learning process that is analogy or if you want, it's a key ingredient. So classification is in fact at the basis of the scientific method. And uh, there are countless examples uh, that uh, we can make uh, of our breakthroughs in the understanding of, of everything uh, what was done. One example for all is Mendeleev's table where, whereby Mendeleev by classifying uh, elements uh, by uh, weight and uh, valence, uh, they, could actually find uh, uh, a place for every element and also missing places, which were later filled by new elements that were found afterwards. And a similar thing has happened with the quark model, if we want to, to make an example closer to our heart. So it is thus no surprise to me that the advancement in supervised learning in particular are bringing huge benefits to fundamental physics research today. So let's come to our, our own field now. Uh, it's, uh, I will focus on high energy physics, although there are commonalities to other fields. In our energy physics, we study the structure of matter by making these powerful collisions uh, at the Large Hadron Collider and in other big uh, facilities. And then we need to reconstruct the reactions from the, 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 the wealth of information that we collect maybe hundreds of millions of electronic channels. So we have a huge dimensionality reduction uh, task that we need to do and pattern recognition to get uh, to the point of being able to do some inference and extract parameters uh, about the collisions. And uh, we of course uh, are in the, in, the, in the business of identifying rare signals because uh, we want all that has been uh, already discovered is uh, interesting, but not uh, so interesting. And so we always look at the bottom of it. Uh, so we we'll scan these enormous data sets dominated by backgrounds and search for new signals. And that is what we do by classification. And of course, we want to measure physical quantities. So regression and optimized inference play a role. And uh, uh, we do uh, searches also by looking for unpredicted structures, things that uh, even theorists cannot uh, predict. And we want to scan our data and not leave any corner behind uh, un un unsearched. So we have unsupervised learning techniques for that, clustering anomaly detection. Uh, so uh, computer science has uh, given uh, an enormous uh, boost to these uh, activities in the past, uh, I would say, 15 years in particular, in particle physics. Uh, the main directions that we have taken in uh, research in artificial intelligence uh, applications uh, are in particular uh, these that I list. They, this is just uh, a, a nitpicking, of course. But I can uh, see that uh, as far as classification goes, for instance, the identification of the flavor of hadronic jets uh, remains one of the focuses because uh, uh, the possibility to uh, identify the flavor of uh, uh, energetic jets 
opens the way to searches for new phenomena, pretty much, at the LHC at least. And the, also the identification of, of hadronic decays of, uh, of weak bosons and Higgs bosons and top quarks within fat boosted jets is uh, also uh, giving benefits of uh, new physics searches across the board. So these are among the tasks of classification that I would single out as the most interesting and important. But then we have, of course, uh, pattern recognition, which uh, remains uh, very important uh, as we move uh, to very high luminosity conditions of the LHC. And uh, we have to make sense of all the, the, the data. So generative models and fast simulation of electromagnetic and hadronic showers in our detectors are, are become compelling uh, because of the time, uh, large amount of computing time that it needs to simulate uh, this wealth of data. And another issue that I think is at the forefront of research for us is the incorporation of nuisance parameters in statistical inference. Uh, taking the two-step process by means of which we first derive a, 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 a point estimate without accounting for the systematic uncertainties and then accounting for them, this becomes suboptimal when you train a classifier to help you with the point estimate. So all of these applications are in common, the fact that they can be tackled with deep learning algorithms. And uh, so I will give uh, uh, just a, a few very quick examples of what exists here, because I want to leave space at the end to discuss uh, what I think is uh, the most interesting uh, thing uh, uh, for the future. Uh, which uh, are ideas connecting with the fact that you want to really bring everything together and do end-to-end -end optimization, not only of, uh, of uh, statistical inference, but on the whole of the design of an experiment. So cooking up good summary statistics is an important task for us. We have 100 million electronic signals and their decoding uh, uh, is, uh, is, uh, is very complex, of course. And uh, the challenge to retain uh, the information, to retain the sufficiency of our, of our summary statistics is, uh, is really hard. Here you see one very important summary statistics, the mass of uh, four leptons uh, reconstructed by the CMS experiment, which produced the, the observation of the X boson in 2012. Uh, you have heard yesterday, I think, uh, in a talk by Kai Kramer, uh, who is an expert uh, in, uh, in uh, simulation-based inference, uh, the problems that arise when you have such a complexity of all the physical processes that compete uh, and contribute to provide your observed uh, data, that uh, it becomes impossible to use uh, a, a true likelihood of, of, the, of, of the data, even parameters, or likelihood of parameters, of course, and then uh, the ways that we have uh, to overcome this. So I will not cover this uh, very much in this talk, but it is uh, certainly a, a very important issue in our business today. Uh, I will note that the deep learning has uh, arisen in, uh, in, uh, in particle physics uh, after the Higgs boson discovery. And this is not a coincidence, or if it is maybe uh, there is a link still uh, because in 2012, uh, ImageNet, uh, uh, the, that challenge where uh, computers had to identify ima images um, also was at the turning point. So the technology was mature enough that uh, we also benefited from these tools uh, as we never did before. And nowadays, if we do an analysis uh, in particle physics, we have to use machine learning techniques uh, and before 2012, instead, uh, we were frowned upon if we did. Now, further evidence of the benefit of these tools uh, was given by the Kaggle Higgs challenge, uh, where uh, 100 and, uh, 1,800 teams of participating that were no, not just physicists, but also statisticians and computer scientists that tried to uh, discriminate the Higgs boson decays to tau leptons, which was a complicated, uh, which is a complicated signal to extract from LHC data uh, from backgrounds. And uh, this, this taught a few things. So the most effective solution was, first of all, uh, obtained by a statistician, not by uh, a physicist. 
and was extracted by a pool of deep neural networks uh, with a lot of emphasis on cross-validation. And, uh, and, uh, and you see the difference uh, that uh, there is in the score, which is basically a pseudo-significance of the extracted X boson signal, which if you compare to techniques that were used uh, still uh, 15 years ago, uh, like one-dimensional cut-based selections of the signals, it is equivalent in this case to acquiring six times more data, which makes the hell of a difference uh, for a machine that costs uh, millions of euros uh, to operate uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and so data is costly, of course. If we look deeper in the best solution, we can have a more uh, insight. And this is a work uh, of a collaborator of mine, Zal Strong, who reproduced uh, the best solution with a similar uh, setup, but much more GPU efficient. And he was able also to find and understand exactly what was giving uh, the, the advantages uh, of the best solution. Uh, because he actually reproduced exactly the score that, uh, that Gabor Melis had found. And he found that, uh, of course, producing better, some better summaries by data augmentation uh, um, is, is a part of uh, exploiting the symmetries in the data, for instance, and uh, was, was a big part of it, but also good, the biggest part of the, the advantages of these solutions was the ensembling of various learners. So, okay, we, we are learning how to use these tools better now, and we are customizing them and uh, perfecting them to our tasks. And uh, one of the tasks that we have is, as I said, the identification of boosted uh, decays of, uh, of uh, W, Zs, uh, X, uh, and top quarks uh, inside a, a fat hadronic jet. Uh, this, uh, this has been a revolution in particle physics when we realized that, that we could tag these objects and discriminate them from QCD backgrounds much better than if these, uh, these, uh, they decay uh, with a lower boost. Uh, and then uh, you have a combinatorial problem of identifying the right decay products, et cetera. And, uh, and this is an image reconstruction problem because if you, see, if you see on the bottom left, you see the image of a signal of a top uh, hadronic decay uh, as averaged from many, many events at the center or as you would see from only one event on the left. And the background instead uh, is, uh, is a more uniform distribution so that uh, you can, uh, you can uh, uh, operate uh, a classification of these jets to extract the signal. This is pretty much at the forefront. So we use convolutional neural networks for these tasks because they have been proven to be very good for these kind of tasks. Now, another important uh, task is uh, tracking uh, in dense environments. Uh, it is challenging to, to do tracking uh, when you have hundreds of particles coming out. Uh, uh, CMS operates this by doing something that is called uh, the particle flow, which uses the tracker and the calorimeter together to identify every single particle and trying to associate energy deposits to each. And this has actually saved the CMS uh, in the business of uh, reconstructing particle uh, boosted uh, decays of, uh, of, of, uh, of these objects because uh, CMS had invested uh, only a small factor of its budget in constructing the hadron calorimeter uh, and uh, was at a disadvantage initially with respect to its competitor Atlas. And uh, it regained the lost ground thanks to this algorithm, which could leverage the fact that the CMS has twice a stronger magnet uh, than Atlas. If you think about this, this is a misalignment and a post hoc exploitation of the magnet of CMS, which was conceived to have a better resolution for charged particles to do a kind of physics that is not this one. We realized later on that we could apply it, uh, exploit this uh, to exploit the high field integral to actually do particle flow. And we got uh, back uh, the same kind of resolution that Atlas has. So this is an example of the fact that if you don't think well at what you are going to do with your detector, you're going to find the construction solutions that are not optimal for the task. 
and we will touch on this topic later on. To preserve the performance of our reconstruction methods in the future, where the Large Hadron Collider will run with 200 pileup events every 40, every 25 nanoseconds, there are techniques uh, and uh, they rely on, on clustering and uh, object condensation. For instance, this is uh, by Ian Kieseler that uh, I, I don't have the time to explain you in detail what this works, how this works, but it basically uh, in a cluster, in an abstract space, you can cluster objects uh, and assign the property of those objects uh, to one element with, uh, uh, and then uh, let this converge by using an attractive potential uh, that uh, that is in the presence of other objects that attract themselves themselves uh, the various elements and you see that this technique uh, uh, works very well in an abstract example of identifying shapes of various kinds and uh, and, uh, and this has been proven to also improve further on the performance of the particle flow method when you apply this to identifying yeah, the objects inside an electromagnetic shower in a calorimeter. So this is an interesting uh, uh, avenue for few further developments in high luminosity LHC conditions. Now, I was talking about the incorporation of nuisance parameters in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in inference in classification, basically dimensionality reduction, if you want. There is a misalignment here uh, in, uh, in the dimensionality reduction that we do uh, with a classifier and the true goal of the analysis, which have to incorporate uh, systematic uncertainties only after the classifier has been trained. And so realizing this problem, a number of deep learning techniques uh, have been proposed and are actually very effective that parameterize the effect of nuisances as inputs to the neural networks when you can do that, or they correlate the summary statistics from the, the variable that you want to, to, be, to, 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 to extract inference from, or other ways again. And one of them is to make the loss of the neural network directly aware of the final objective and the method of extraction of your parameter of interest. It's impossible to review this, but uh, I have written a chapter of a book that is going to be published soon on exactly this topic, and it's on the archive. Uh, so let's take it one step further. Uh, I've, I've talked to you about uh, the current trends, which are advanced uh, and already well-established research avenues uh, that exploit existing techniques uh, for our purposes. Uh, but uh, we should look much further as we have always done because uh, uh, for us, uh, we design things uh, that we exploit uh, 20 years down the line because uh, the time from blueprint to physics result in particle physics is of that kind of, 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 of lens. So in the following, I wish to discuss what I personally believe uh, it will be the next paradigm shift in particle physics. We have seen one, the X discovery in 2012. I think we are going to see another one when we start to be able to take seriously the issue of end-to-end -end optimization of, uh, uh, of uh, research in fundamental physics. So as a way of introduction, let me remind you that uh, the update of the European strategy for particle physics encourages us uh, to do feasibility studies for new large long-term projects, which will once again push the skills uh, uh, that we have in technology, okay? So, so this is again, higher demands, but we are facing uh, unprecedented global challenges in the world. So the funding for fundamental research in physics uh, is probably uh, at, uh, at, uh, at risk. So we have to invest our money as well as we can. That we have, we have uh, actually a, a real reason, an additional real reason to make the best of any resources that are spent in fundamental research, okay? so. With this in mind, I think uh, we need to look beyond the, the status quo and the way we have been doing business in the past 50 years. Uh, 
we have been constructing these giant machines uh, 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 using some underlying global paradigms that have guided our hand and have remained mostly unchallenged because they work very well. So one such paradigm is track first to destroy later. We first track charged particle in a very light medium and only later do we measure the energy of both charged and neutral particles in a, a dense medium, a calorimeter. And this works well, but uh, maybe there is, uh, there is some suboptimality there which we, can, uh, uh, which we can investigate with machines. And of course, we have always strived for redundancy because we are looking for uh, invisible subatomic particles and uh, we need to be very care careful and uh, be able to verify that our measurements uh, are consistent and cross calibrate them okay and then we try to build these things uh, with symmetrical layouts because uh, well first of all it's uh, convenient but uh, also we think that uh, symmetry is a good thing but if you think about it the hadronic shower is not symmetric so then there is something to improve there possibly uh, this, these choices have served us very well, but they do not directly maximize a higher level utility function, such as could be the di highest di discovery reach for a physical process, okay? So let's, let's tackle this problem. What, what, what do we really mean when we say that something is optimal? The reason why detectors are complex is not only that the study of physics is complex, but also we are competitive. We want to study everything, but also do it better than what was previously done. So uh, for a detector to, to be optimal, you have to specify in machine learning terms, a loss function. But what is the loss function that we want to minimize uh, in, in a complex particle physics experiment? Does it make sense to speak of a single one? Of course, we want to measure the Higgs boson self couplings, but we also want to discover new physics and we want to measure the physics properties. So really, can we do that? I, so this is a question that has been, I have been confronted with and I'm convinced that it does make sense. And I will try to do the same with you. So we actually are routinely compare, confronted with uh, with, uh, with uh, complex decisions in a multi-objective uh, space. So if you have to organize the perfect dinner, you want to do it in style, you want to not break the bank, you want to be close to home and uh, all the other things in between. Uh, so and we do it routinely. We are not deterred by knowing that our target is maybe not too universal, that applies to us only. So I think that, uh, and I could make examples of the optimization of the trigger for a large particle physics experiment where there's a lot of conflicting criteria and you have a certain bandwidth that you want to fit maybe a thousand events among 40 million. And that is complicated, right? So it's a complex optimization, multi-objective and we do it. So we should be able to, to, to construct a recipe for a perfect detector. And that is a little bit of a spoiler here. And you can do this by model with continuous functions, the, the cost of, of put, uh, employing a certain amount of time to construct your detector and spending a certain amount of money in the uh, understanding what is your discovery reach for new processes or how well you measure certain important parameters. And once you have that, you can create a differentiable model of the geometry of your detector, the components, the information extraction procedures, and the, the utility function, which is multi-objective maybe, but you can specify it. And then you will be able to construct a pipeline with those modules which uh, like a neural network will enable back propagation and gradient descent uh, to the minimum of the loss and the maximization of your objective. And at the end of it, what, uh, what works is that the chain rule of differential calculus, okay? So we will see what we need to do to, to enable such a thing. Uh, first of all, I want to say that when we design the, the detector, we choose the sensors for a tracker, we operate choices on budget allocations or define requirements for the resolutions. 
we are trying to find an optimal point uh, in a loosely constrained feature space, uh, which has hundreds, if not thousands of dimensions. And this, I argue, is clearly a superhuman task that we cannot really do a good job at. So we know it. And uh, because of that, we set our aim on makeshift surrogates of the real objectives that we have. So for instance, we might desire our, 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 our objective to be uh, this, uh, the, the highest precision of the self-coupling of the X, but we cannot do that. Uh, so we, we can stick to, to useful proxies of that, uh, so, such as uh, the highest achievable energy resolution for isolated photons, because we know that the two things will go along well. So, and, and then we use simulation that allow us to prove the, probe the result of these choices that we make. But the simulations, if, uh, uh, if we use Giant, which is an incredibly uh, a useful tool, but allows us to pro probe the result of the choices that we make, it doesn't allow us to map the interdependencies and find the, the extrema of a utility function in, in the space. So that is what we really need, in fact. So evolving from this modus operandi to directly goal-informed decisions is, uh, is a realignment and uh, may allow for potentially enormous performance gains. Why do I say that? Because there is evidence for that. Uh, I will get there in a second. Also, I should mention that the design space has grown larger now that we can 3D print scintillators, for instance, or, or, or do fancy things with, with uh, silicon AC coupled uh, detectors. And of course, the performance demands are raising and therefore we need to, to find a better solution. Uh, speaking of calorimeters, uh, high granularity is important for those uh, uh, boosted jets uh, tagging uh, and also for, uh, for high luminosity has become compelling. In fact, the HGCAL calorimeter for CMS uh, has been uh, built uh, with that in mind. And uh, there's a number of developments in this area, but an end-to-end -end optimization of the design of these instruments has not been attempted yet, okay? Uh, and uh, there, are, uh, there are even uh, examples of the fact that these things uh, get built, uh, built uh, without uh, the, 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 their exploitation in, in mind. Uh, if you know that uh, you are going to use uh, a machine learning technique for uh, making sense of the data, you should make uh, the output of this machine of these detectors more machine learning friendly. So there are ideas of building a hybrid calorimeters, integrating the tracking and the calorimeter. Uh, when uh, we, we think about an FCC collider where we will have muons that fly away with uh, 10 TV energy, you cannot measure their energy by, by bending their tracks because you don't have a magnet powerful enough. So, you will have to measure their energy in the, by the radiative loss that they withstand in a dense granular calorimeter. So we have studied that. I will show you that in a second. And uh, maybe nuclear interactions in the future will be used to do particle ID. So these are ideas that the machine could investigate. Let's talk about the muon energy measurement. In very, very high boosted regime, the muon starts losing uh, significant amounts of energy by radiative uh, uh, processes. And uh, you know that in a typical uh, superconducting magnet, uh, a one TV muon is deflected by one millimeter. And uh, if you have a 10 TV muon, you start uh, losing resolution, okay? So uh, we studied this with the convolutional neural network uh, in a regression task. And uh, we took uh, a, 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 a a, a highly granular calorimeter, and uh, we studied the, the resolution that we could, could obtain with a, with a neural network on the energy by making sense of the pattern of these radiation deposits. And we found that, that we can recover 20% resolution at 4 TV of, of muon energy by combining uh, the, or, uh, at that point, the, tra the, 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 tra the the curvature of the muon is no, no longer useful. It's uh, that orange line in the graph on the lower, uh, uh, lower right, uh, where you see that uh, 
the calorimetric measurement wins over the tracking measurement very much. Uh, so how large are the gains of a full optimization of your devices? Um, so experimental design, uh, uh, as is carried out to today, leaves ample room for improvement. And uh, even seemingly irrelevant choices for the placement of active and passive material in a simple detector can do the trick. Uh, I, I had a chance to study this uh, because I was referring uh, a, a detector proposed by the Muone collaboration, which wants to determine with high precision the cross-section of elastic electron muon scattering, because that uh, is uh, a leading source of systematic uncertainty to the G minus two measurement uh, of, of the muon anomaly, uh, which is uh, showing a 4.2 sigma discrepancy with the standard model as of now. So in the study that I made, I demonstrated that uh, you could obtain a factor of two improvement in the, in, the, in the utility function by just moving away by the choices that are dictated by past experience. So this is the layout of one module of the muon experiment, you have a muon coming in, hitting a beryllium target, and then getting tracked along with the electron in a few silicon modules. And this is repeated 40 times in the arrangement that is proposed by muon. Eh? And uh, OK, and the, the experiment aims at measuring this uh, adronic loop contribution to the, to the, uh, to the anomalous uh, magnetic moment of the muon, OK, which is one of the leading sources of theoretical uncertainty which leads to this uh, discrepancy of the standard model and the experimental measurement. So I did a, a, a study of this uh, and, uh, and, uh, and I optimized the geometry, which is very simple apparatus with just uh, layers of silicon alternating at some distance from the, the, the targets. I argued that you could uh, split the target in many successive layers, very thin, and that would give you leverage to the cube square of the event. And in fact, you get a gain of a factor of two in the uh, resolution Q square in the relevant uh, kinematic region. So if you can get a factor of two improvement in a figure of merit for a detector made of layers uh, uh, such as that and with three particles, imagine what you can do with a more complex uh, uh, physics, right? I think it's a huge possible dividend that you can get. And so we have, uh, we have computer science at our, at our side that can help us, but uh, artificial intelligence is everywhere, but it's uh, application specific as we know, uh, its application depends on the developing the right interfaces. And so far, <laughs> it has been applied only to things that are uh, profitable. And so we are bound to develop our own applications. Now, there is a, a new paradigm shift that is impending on us uh, because differentiable programming, which is the new nickname of deep learning, if you want, it has become a thing. Now, there are tools on the market like uh, TensorFlow, PyTorch, uh, JAX that allow us to do this and uh, uh, eases the systematic search of minima of arbitrarily complex uh, multidimensional function. Okay, so you all you need to do is to create differentiable models of your system. But it is difficult because we are confronted with the stochastic nature of the quantum processes at the basis of the interaction of radiation with matter. So this has held us back for a little while. Nonetheless, automatic differentiation is, uh, is, uh, is a very neat way to uh, have uh, 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 being able to specify a function, a piece of code, and then the libraries allow uh, directly to have access in an exact form to the differential of this function. Okay, so this, this actually can be the key to uh, implement uh, our solutions. Uh, one way to apply this is, uh, in, uh, as I said before, applying uh, inference-aware analysis methods that uh, teach the neural network uh, exactly what we want to do with uh, the classification that it's uh, performing, so that it becomes aware of systematics uh, effects and can uh, realign uh, its output to these. And you do this with differentiable programming, 
we, com we constructed uh, a, 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 a pipeline whereby the neural network is informed of uh, the Hessian, uh, the information matrix, if you want, of the final measurement that you do when you take the summary of the neural network and you use it for inference. And this provides large gains in the ultimate uh, precision of the inference. So we, we, have, uh, we are in the process now of proving this on a real CMS analysis. The, this, uh, the article that I'm citing here is only based on synthetic examples so far. But okay, uh, there's people that have uh, used the differentiable programming uh, to optimize the magnets of an experiment that uh, looks for dark matter. And here the muon flux, uh, you want to reduce it. And you see that, uh, that the machine learns the best configuration of the magnets that reduces by a factor of two again the flux of muons in your detector. And so again, this is a simple setup, only a few variables are considered, but uh, we have to start with simple, uh, simple applications and go towards uh, more complex ones. And this is the task of a group I've formed uh, of physicists from a few nodes uh, that you see here. Uh, there's Kyle Kramer, but there's also many other computer scientists and physicists that are actually uh, want to uh, apply differentiable programming for these problems that we have. The end-to-end -end optimization of experimental design. You can do it if you pull it off in a scheme like this one, where on the left you have uh, uh, what you would say is a giant, you have uh, something that samples the latent space of the parameters and uh, simulates uh, a, a collisions or whatever you have at the basis of your inference. And then uh, you can actually create a model of that uh, with a differentiable simulator surrogate. You can validate it and, uh, and then use it in a pipeline which uh, includes uh, the parameters that determine the geometry of your detector the systematic uncertainties, uh, the pattern recognition that you're going to apply to extract your inference uh, and your analysis model, the cost of the detector. And if you pull it off, you are able to optimize the full chain. Well, of course, this is complicated. We want to study first with use cases that are easy. So uh, we have taken on a few easy use cases to start with. One of them is uh, uh, muon tomography, which includes uh, just uh, cosmic ray muons uh, as the basis of your inference. So it's uh, the part of the uh, creating the surrogate of the, of the simulator is, is easy there, right? And this is a simplified version. So uh, muon tomography is everywhere. Applications are countless to study the core of volcanoes uh, or or archaeological prospections and uh, nuclear waste uh, and whatever. And, uh, and you can uh, study unknown volumes by passing muons through them. Now we have created the differentiable pipeline and uh, we have modeled a generic system that we can then uh, customize to any other task. And uh, we have shown that you can teach uh, a, a pipeline how to minimize uh, the loss function to do the inference, but also optimize the inference uh, by modifying the detector. Of course, this is work in progress and there's still a long way to go, but it's an important milestone for, um, for us to prove that this kind of technology is uh, ready uh, and we can start to exploit it. We have uh, uh, run a workshop on differentiable programming where we put together both physicists and computer scientists uh, we had, uh, we had several interesting talks. Uh, they are recorded and available if you are interested. This was possible uh, by the, the generous funding of Iris HEP uh, and uh, the APEC NUPEC ECFA consortium that are supporting us. And we've written a short article where we have uh, uh, put together our ideas on how we can construct a library of solutions of simple examples for optimization, such that we gain expertise and we become quicker in putting together solutions for more complex optimization problems, with the goal that one day we will be able to optimize a full detector for a new future particle collider that will take data in 30 years. Now, if you think about it, in 30 years, it will not be a, 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 
Kalman filter, what will reconstruct the tracks inside our, our, our detector, it will be the task of an artificial intelligence to do so. And so if we design a detector today with, uh, uh, with our current today's reconstruction capabilities in mind, we are going to construct a detector that is not optimized for the possibilities that we will have in 30 years. So these kind of technologies I've talked about will be able to realign our uh, construction choices today to what we'll be able uh, to do in 30 years. So I have uh, concluded uh, this, uh, this uh, very personal, I think, uh, view of uh, what is the future of uh, deep learning for particle physics. And I'm ready to take your questions. Are you still there? I cannot hear anything. Can, can you hear us now? Yes, now, okay, yes. Sorry about that. <laughs> okay, thank you, Tomas. <laughs> and uh, there are uh, time for uh, at least a couple of questions, uh, if someone has. Uh, I don't see in the chat uh, any questions. Okay, there is a uh, hand raised. Uh, Feng, please go ahead. Uh, hi, well, thanks for the talk. So I have uh, this question, like uh, this end-to-end -end optimization. So like, do you have some numbers, like uh, how, how many parameters are you shooting for? Uh, like for a typical size, the problem? Yeah, so uh, this is a, a strongly dependent on the kind of problem you want to tackle and uh, how you parameterize it, of course. So if we look at past applications, such as this one I've shown uh, of uh, the optimization of the magnets uh, for the beamline of the ship experiment, you see that the number of parameters that they, con con that they consider is uh, of the order of uh, 20, something like that. Uh, so, the number of parameters is certainly a concern for uh, CPU consumption, but uh, to us, uh, it's uh, more uh, important to realize uh, the feasibility of the, form, the whole uh, idea because, uh, because uh, yes, uh, I mean, uh, CPU uh, consumption is, uh, is always a problem that will solve by itself a little bit as we move to more and more powerful machines. Uh, of course, I think nowadays I would say that uh, the number of parameters that you can consider for, for a very complex uh, detector, well, for the, for the applications that we have, we are shooting for uh, tens of parameters, not, uh, not, uh, not thousands, okay? No. But, uh, but okay, it's, uh, I think, a long process of going from simple use cases to harder ones. Uh, thank you. Yes. Yep. Are there other questions? Okay. Yeah. Hello, Tommaso. Many thanks for your talk. Is uh, Biagio Lucini from uh, Creto. Um, okay. I want to ask you. Um, I mean, how much of your problem is a design problem of um, the? Um, So if I understand your question is, uh, is, uh, uh, what is the hard part in this scheme? Is it, uh, yeah. is it uh, computational or is it uh, modeling? Yes, exactly. Yeah, so I think that uh, for now, for the problems that we are considering, the problem is more of a conceptual nature in terms of uh, modeling uh, as accurately as possible the important ingredients. 
because, uh, you know, as I mentioned, the stochastic uh, processes at the basis of the creation of our data uh, are, are a little bit uh, um, hard to, to, be cre to create a differentiable model of. You think can do it with the variational autoencoders or uh, adversarial network setups, but uh, this is a, a huge job on which uh, Lots of uh, brilliant minds are, are banging their heads on as far as, uh, for instance, the modeling of hadronic showers in a calorimeter are concerned. This is a huge task. But if you start uh, with simpler uh, problems such as muon tomography, that is uh, not uh, such uh, a huge concern. Indeed, the computational complexity is something that you have to tackle and, uh, and uh, and confront with, uh, and uh, but you, you will notice that uh, a system such as this one has uh, many uh, blocks that can, uh, in, uh, in some cases, uh, be optimized independently by freezing some parts of the parameter spaces and uh, releasing others. So the, the, the big complexity of such a setup can be broken down into smaller problems at times. So for now, we are more concerned with the feasibility of, uh, of continuous modeling, which is really the key to be able to explore in a, in a continuous way the space of the parameter uh, the parametric space of solutions. But of course, complexity uh, of uh, computation uh, is, is still a concern. Okay, thank you for the comprehensive answer. Thanks a lot. Yep. Okay, so we thank you, Thomas, again, and uh, we have to move uh, to the next uh, speaker. Okay, thank you for thank having you. me. Bye-bye. Uh,